All right. I don't know what happened to my picture. There we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right, I would like to welcome everyone to our first WCA Second Saturday session. Um, today we have the WCA Leadership Interview Project. Uh, WCA's Art Writers Committee is interviewing Ruth Weisberg, Barbara Wolanin, and Yuriko Takata. And we will have ample time for audience interaction and questions. Um, the WCA Leadership Project is spearheaded by the WCA Art Writers Committee and it's an initiative to record and share interviews with WCA leaders in conjunction with celebrating WCA's 50th anniversary. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. And I am going to turn everything over to Patty Jordan and uh, Kiara. Welcome everyone. I'm Patty Jordan and Kiara Atayepi and I will be co-chairing this panel. We know many founding members in WCA have reiterated that immeasurable amounts of feminist content in the 1970s and 80s was co-opted by white male artists. Women artists and change makers are still faced with the challenge of confronting the resulting revisionist and selective histories. Years since WCA was founded, and as our social, social climate has become somewhat more progressive, women are now more self-directed, more focused, and more visible than ever before. And women are coming to realize that they too are feminists and must support the cause to function as vehicles for change. Given our broad socio-political spectrum, women are reorganizing due to an intrinsic need to join networks such as the WCA, especially as its vision expands. Kiara? Thank you, Patty. Um, as women artists and cultural workers, it's imperative to continue to question women's status in the contemporary art world today. More spaces have been claimed for women as we enter the beginning of a post-capitalist era. We now have an abundance of new languages to describe and articulate patriarchal and colonialist tendencies aforementioned. One essential task is to persist in advancing archival practices towards spheres of arts activism. Another area of focus is women's career, professional development, and self-advocacy as prime vehicles for change. We must also continue to hone our ability to traverse ever-changing spaces from domestic spheres to community spheres and from local spheres to global spheres. We'd now like to introduce our panelists. Yuriko Takata is an artist and longstanding WCA member and has served as leadership in various capacities for the Northern California chapter. She was influential in the WCA conference and exhibition Impact, Legacy of the Women's Caucus for Art, 1972 to 2016. In addition, Yuriko has participated in the large scale organizing of WCA's Lifetime Achievement Awards. Ruth Weisberg joined WCA in its founding years back in 1972. She is a multidisciplinary artist working in the genres of painting, drawing, and installation. Ruth is professor of fine arts at the University of Southern California and is former dean of USC's Roski School of Art and Design. Her work is held in the permanent collections of over 60 museums nationally and internationally. Barbara Bolanin, is a long serving member and is active in the Washington DC chapter. She served on WCA's national board. Barbara held the position of curator for the architect of the Capitol in Congress from 1985 to 2015 and is now curator emerita. Here, she oversaw the conservation of murals, sculpture, paintings, research and education, archives and exhibitions. She holds a bachelor, bachelor's in studio art and master's degree in art history from Oberlin College, an MAT in art education from Harvard University, and a PhD in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now let's hear from our panel, panelists on their experience as leadership in WCA. Kiara? Okay, so it's been stated that before the 1970s, women artists were all but invisible. Does anyone care to elaborate? Oh, I can do that. I, when I was in college, there, I used the Janssen's textbook, and there was not one single woman in it. When I started teaching art 
history, same thing. None of the textbooks, even the ones written by women, had one single woman artist in it. And when I started teaching at a woman's college is when it, it was the time that I joined WCA because I realized my students needed to know about women artists. And I gave them all kinds of extra exercises and things like that to read and have their pay, do their papers on women. But I grew up in Washington and none of the museums even had women artists. Maybe Mary Cassatt at the National Gallery, she was probably the only one. So it was just uh, the idea that women artists didn't exist up until the 70s. Wow, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you. Because as a new member, I think so many people don't even realize that all the work that has been done um, and, it, and it wasn't just like this. So thank you. And so my next question, how has WCA evolved in expanding exhibition and networking opportunities for women in the arts? Anyone want that one? Okay, Ruth. Um, I think the WCA has played a really effective and dramatic role in um, gaining much more attention for women artists and their work. Um, in 1972, um, as part of the initial surge in the women's movement, um, artists were very, very active. And um, the San Francisco Conference, you know, I can talk about this at some length, um, you know, in a small, a relatively small room, we founded the WCA. I was there. I was one of the youngest people there. And so sadly, uh, a number of the women or all of the other women who were in the room have passed on. Um, I think I'm the lone survivor. Um, there, there were women. There was also a group of African-American men in the room, which was interesting. I think um, there were white men, but there were black men. and. Uh, I think that we affected um, that movement as well in, 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 in direct and indirect ways. Uh, ultimately in 1976, when we had a big march on the Los Angeles County Museum led by myself and Suzanne Lacey, um, the only men who marched with us were African-American. So that's an interesting sidelight that maybe hasn't been uh, attended to or published. I love that. Thank you. And so my next question is, thank you, Ruth. Is it important for us to attend studio visits with other women artists? Obviously, yes. <laughs> Who wants to go? You guys can just jump on in there. Yeah. Well, I know that I went to countless, maybe 20, 15 to 20 years of, of um, conferences at the Women's Caucus for Arts, always in, con in conjunction with CAA. So all that excitement of getting all these artists and, and artists, women artists from all over the, the country, really. And that we would visit these uh, amazing artist studios. And after years of it, we were also amazingly inspired and educated. And I think it was a huge part of uh, WCA meetings, the national ones for me. And, and I also think that's an important part of the chapters too. I know in our chapter, the studio visits can be so meaningful and um, something we haven't been able to do during the pandemic, but hopefully it's more, more of them can happen. One change, uh, CAA, did meet you know all around the country in major cities san francisco los angeles seattle all had had meetings uh chicago of course in new york but then um i don't know exactly how many years ago but the caa constricted uh, the list of where it could meet to chicago and new york um which you know i i, I understand the reasoning um there's economic reasons to do it that way but I do think that the kind of energy that we were able to both give and receive from individual chapters in different parts of the country has been hurt by that focus. 
that were I old in New York and Chicago. Absolutely agree with you. We used to have chapters form. That's when the DC chapter got going when the meeting was in DC in 91. And we've been going ever since. And we met in Houston, we met in Canada, we met in Dallas. I mean, that was the fun part of going to CA, seeing new museums, and it really helped the WCA too, because different uh, people in different parts of the country got to really take leadership and create the conferences. So I'm very sad about that too. Not even to California, which is terrible. Right. So this is just a, a new question, but do you think that's something we could bring back, should bring back? kind of meeting in different places and being influenced by each other, whether physically or virtually. So what WCA has done is had summer board meetings you know, with different places. And that has done some of that, I think, for WCA um, in the summers. And I, that's, you know, I got to go to Montana the only time and that was for a WCA summer meeting. I mean, really the, looking back at my life, that's been, been a big plus. But I think, I think it's sad about the College Art Association. I remember talking to some of the leadership and they just kept claiming they were losing money if they didn't go to just the big cities. And, and that's really too bad, I think. So what specific spaces uh, should we occupy to create permanent change, such as academic, political, or cultural arenas? Well, two very obvious um, uh, arenas are um, the you know the universities and colleges. The, the uh, school situations are very very important because they affect um, the formation of students coming up and coming into the profession. Um, and uh, you know you, you can take things for granted, and then a whole generation of students will be oblivious, you know, and not understand how important it is to, to fight for uh, uh, equal attention and promotion and uh, exposure. So I think that's, that's one realm. The other realm is the, the more commercial um, and, and public realm also of museums, um, who gets represented in museums and galleries. Um, is, is very, very important and uh, tends to shape history. Um, if you have a big retrospective at the Met, <laughs> you're gonna be pretty much guaranteed a, a place in history if you-, you know, That's one place where I've seen change. I mean, I, I saw the big Alice Neal show um, yes. at the Met. I mean, she's one of our life, you know, first lifetime achievement awardees, but for years there were no solo exhibitions at museums for women. And talking about art departments when WCA was formed, there, there were almost no women that had tenure, no women professors, even though at least half or more of the students were women. And uh, today, I think the problem is all the adjunct positions, which was, make it so difficult for people to teach and live. Very good point. Um, so, and this is for anyone, what is the significance of WCA's Lifetime Achievement Awards for women's leadership? Well, we have one on our panel, Ruth is one of them. <laughs> and I did the, worked on the big show in 2016 about that and learned about every single one of the 200 people. And it is so inspiring. And I recommend to anybody, if you have a chance to go to one of these ceremonies, you'll never forget it. And uh, I just always almost get moved to tears at, at the achievements, all, all the women. And I think that's a really big thing that WC has done. Is, and when, you, when I was doing the research for the catalog and I looked up the different artists online, they all mentioned, it was all there in their Wikipedia article, or whatever, the Women's Caucus Lifetime Achievement Award. It was something that meant a lot to them. They were proud of and it's there in history. Absolutely. Here, here. <laughs> Yes, Eureka, Eureka, um, yeah. I just want to say that for me, it is maybe the biggest hook for me was to experience these amazing, uh, it, it sounds silly, but they were like love fests, mm -hmm. where these, you know, five or six women would get these awards. And because WCA <coughs> was quite pioneering and early in recognizing some of these women that well, well, well deserved to be recognized and many were not. It was just wonderful to see firsthand 
these uh, women that were just beyond accomplishing and just exemplary in their field, whether it be scholarship, writing, um, we had some performance artists, we had two-dimensional visual artists, all sorts of, um, you know, disciplines that were, uh, that were shown and uh, different ethnicities as well. So that we got really a lovely, um, a lovely um, board, a large board of beautiful people that we got to really um, see, know, and be inspired by. I would just like to follow up with a question since you've all talked so much about how important it is for women artists to get representation in these arenas. I want to take off on a little bit what Eureka was talking about with the publications. How imperative is it for WCA to form relationships and artists in WCA with publications, either inside publishers or outside publishers? How does this help us grow? Um, you know, the written history um, is the history. Um, when people pass on, you know, their individual memories can easily be lost, but the written history remains. I think that has also now shifted and changed and been affected by other kinds of recordings, you know, things online and, um, you know, it's written in books, but it's not only written in books, it's also in other locations now. So, you know, this is a different world than it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. There are, there are more avenues of exposure. And I think we've taken some very good advantage of that and need to continue thinking about that, how, how to uh, expose a more general population to the achievements of women. Right. The, what I worry about in my job at the Capitol was 100 years from now, the websites aren't going to be retrievable, probably. And, you know, the digital things, everybody that's are important, but we need the publications, too, I think, and things in libraries. And one of the big ones about the Women's Caucus was uh, published by the Boston chapter leaders, the book called Blaze that Eleanor Dickinson had written the history of WCA, which is something I've relied on when I've done some more summary things for the catalogs. And that conference, that was very inspiring because a lot of people talk, women there talked about how much WCA had meant to them. And that that book is, is, is uh, really worthwhile. So we need things like that. But I also think the, uh, the lifetime achievement catalogs are also a, a good, very good thing that WCA has continued to be dedicated to get, getting these published and fundraising for them and everything. I um, was lucky enough to meet uh, during the Lifetime Achievement Awards at some point, um, June Wayne, who introduced me to her friend, Cynthia Navaretta. And Cynthia Navaretta was, um, you know, the sole uh, publisher of Mid-March Press. She owned it, she did it, she, made all you know she got all these authors and many of them were um you know because of her experience with the um early abstract expressionist movement who her husband um uh was a part of with you know um oh the big boys um jackson pollock uh, yeah <laughs> yeah to name a few exactly and um that they uh that her books were amazing. She had like 50 titles. And at that time to do a book in the 60s, I think it might have been on early Western women photographers was one of them and feminist surrealists. I mean, she really had a, a quite a roster of books that she um, would have at the uh, WCA book fair. I mean, the CAA book exhibition um, every year for decades. And that was really interesting for me because I helped her for a while and these young professors would come in and want to hear about, you know, certain stories and books and they were all in these small uh, publications that she was, since she was the still publisher, there was no other editorial. The artists often got, um, you know, exact to say exactly what they wanted to. Another publication is the Woman's Art Journal that both Elsa Fine and then Joan Martyr, who took over as editors, got in our Lifetime Achievement Awards because those have been for art historians and writers and people in the community as well as visual artists. 
On those related, yeah, did anybody want to expound on that? I know that um, at some point, Cynthia Navarreta asked me if I wanted a full uh, library of the women's art news journals. She had them somewhere in her house and it was full of artwork and full of everything. And now I'm sorry, I said no. <laughs> Why did you say no? <laughs> It should have been archived in the library. You would have given me two big boxes full of old publications. I don't know why I said no. I wasn't thinking. Where are they now? She passed on, what, about two or three years ago, maybe two years ago. And um, I, 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 I really have no idea. Those things, those newsletters are crucial. I've done work on women's organizations. And if you don't have the newsletter, letters. There's no other way to find out what happened. We should try to find out where they are, who, who, who she ultimately gave them to. Right. And since we're Women's Caucus, we need to, the, our, our, I know we have a central archives, but the chapters also need to be archiving their newsletters and things and making sure they're, they're someplace safe. These are all um, good points and related to that, um, what does WCA as, it's, as an organization need to focus on as well as this point with publication? What does WCA as an organization need to focus on to carry on its feminist legacy or other ways we can do that? Well, I think one obvious answer is both to um, have a, a better record of what has happened and then um, a very intelligent mechanism for recording things as they happen. Um, you know, this is so valuable. We can see that now. As people pass away, as papers get dispersed, um, if we have a kind of central archive or know or are able to establish one, it's going to just be so valuable in the future. I know that Judith Brodsky has done some very important work of creating archives. Um, and uh, I wish she was with us today. That would be helpful. But I think I'm very pleased about this active publications committee. I used to try to be on the publications committee for years on the national board, and we always had lots of ideas, but we you're making things happen, which is great. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. We have one last question to the general group before Kiara um, asks individual questions to Yuriko Takata. Can, can you tell us all why you've stayed in WCA all these years? I've stayed because I love the people I've met on the national level and the chapter level. And I've met people I never would have met in my life. Um, people that were like art teachers in DC, people from all around the area. And that's what's kept me in. And also I, I, I love the idea of being with artists. I'm an art historian. So that's part of the draw for me is I love all the artists that I've met. <clears throat> and I believe in the mission very strongly. Thank you, Ruth or Eureka, you'd like to elaborate your points, uh, your no, take? I would probably say the same thing. I mean, we used to have a lot of fun at the at the uh, meetings, chapter meetings uh, locally, and the national, uh, the life, uh, the lifetime achievement awards, of course. But just the um, conferences, the WCA conferences, and the few CA things that, that you would go through. It was really pretty um, uh, enlivening and inspiring, and um, I think that's it. And besides that, like I've met people like Barbara. Barbara and I come from very different worlds. I live in San Francisco. Barbara lives in Washington, and 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 I love her. <laughs> I've never had her. So it's funny, you know. We've just come to know each other just by me seeing each other every once or twice a year. But somehow the connections are so genuine and heartfelt and that we really go through these amazing little adventures together going to studios meeting these lifetime achievement award winners having little you know tussles on the bus and whatnot you know it's just it really creates this whole world of of, of memories that we have made together with a good mission 
<laughs> I think that's a good segue um, since you brought up memories, right, Patty, to talk about um, Eureka, you're a member of the Northern California chapter. Can you tell us some of your fondest memories of the chapter? Well, I, yeah, 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 I, I, um, I'm not as involved with the local as I should now. I used to be much more. I guess it, a lot of it is because a lot of my mentors who used to be my very best friends and we were just so close, and they've all passed away basically. So I, I'm not as involved as I used to be, but goodness, we've had some great memories together for sure. One of the things I was thinking about is going to a member's um, ranch. I think her name was Irma Velasquez, forgive me if I get that wrong, but Irma had the most amazing ranch and we all went out with the idea to make land art. And we were, you know, and, and it just, it never occurred to me to make land art. So it was, it was, and it was really great to see what everybody did with leaves and twigs. And, and so things like that were really take you out of yourself. And that was, that was a great thing. I think we also did a, um, a day retreat somewhere. One of the members was showing how to make a, what does he call it? Cyanotypes, you know, where you put things out in the sun with the paper and, you know, somebody else was making little clay uh, things. And, and it was just, it was really great. Everybody shared their um, their talents, and um, it it inspired a lot of um, interconnection and um, communication within the group. You know what? When you mention <laughs> when you mention the land, I'm like, I just have to share this. I'm like very big. You're like sticks and twigs. These are like all over my house. <laughs> I have little pieces of wood. So I'm like, yes, I wish I could be there um, to see it. I know it was probably amazing. Okay, so how did your role as social facilitator or uh, nurturing WCA's fun factor come about? Well, um, I, I think that it might be obvious by now since we're, that we're talking that I'm not so much involved in the, um, the scholarly, um, educational side of the WCA and, and the archival side. Um, I would come just as an artist that really wanted to share and meet some of these wonderful people and get in on the mojo and go to the shows. And I'm an artist too. So of course I always, you know, um, entered the shows even though not getting in was another part of really bonding with your other uh, members because others would also not get into the show. And that was also part of learning how to be a, a strong feminine artist is to take the um, no's as well as the yeses. But um, I feel that um, I would try to get around the edges and have fun. And so going to artist studios, I remember I was, I helped put together the New Orleans conference. Mm -hmm. And so we went to go visit Joan Mitchell's foundation. And um, we went to go visit an artist uh, who was really kind of uh, had an amazing uh, eclectic art studio with her husband who was equally as eclectic, strange and wonderful. Their home was like an obstacle course of crazy artistic things. And, and then we, we, would do, we went to another amazing artist and the, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not doing him justice by not remembering his name, but he's very famous. And he, did, he was a huge uh, garage uh, warehouse space where he would really involve the community and uh, bring the community in. Um, and he uh, uh, had a huge portrait of Coretta Scott King. And I mean, he was really, he was really a mover shaker of the community in a very different way than um, all the other artists that we had seen. So all together, and then I, I missed it, but there was some sort of a performance art piece that was out in the bayou somewhere. And I, <laughs> but you know, I mean, all those different things going on at once really uh, makes for um, an amazing, uh, time. And so I would help as much as I could with the things that would um, kind of keep us happy and busy in the off moments. <laughs> you read to, oh, yes, Ruth. Um, just the role um, of the chapters in bridging the generations is so important. You know, 
we could all get old together or we can reach out to, to younger, you know, former students and younger artists. And that is so important if um, our, our mission is going to flourish and, um, and it needs to flourish. They're, they're, things are much better than they used to be, that's true, but they're not perfect by any means. And um, part of the reason that we've continued to make progress is that we've continued to apply pressure and create attention attracting mechanisms to women artists and their work and their exhibitions. And we, we really, there's an urgent need to go on. And, and the chapters are so important to that ongoing recruitment of younger women artists. I remember <clears throat> one of the, uh, the most re rewarding projects that I was part of was a lunch in New York City and I believe it was under, uh, with Priscilla Otani, the current president. She was quite a dynamo. And we came up with something called, I, it, was, it was a breakfast where we had five different tables with like 10, eight to 10 people a table. And at each table was an honored elder artist of some sort. So we invited, um, m many of them were ex Lifetime Achievement, uh, you know, uh, awardees and we, sat around the tables and at some point we switched chairs so that you know that the that the mentor got to sit and really take in all sorts of questions and 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 then we had set up a table with you know their books or whatever they might have wanted to share as well so i thought that was a wonderful mix oh and it was a fundraiser that was one of the few things i think i did that might have made some money but we, uh, <laughs> we, no, Rico, I have to say, I think of you though, you would always help with the raffle that we had every year to raise money for the Lifetime Achievement Award. He's running around talking to everybody, getting people to do that with tremendous enthusiasm. That's what I, I have this great memory of you doing that. Uh, well, <laughs> the funnest part of that, I must say, was going to the studios. Like I got to go to, um, oh my God, I'm, lo I'm losing my mind. Um, uh, Betty. SARS studio to pick out a piece to be uh, raffled. So of course I was very invested <laughs> in trying to get people to actually donate and make and, and make a you know as much money as possible for the raffle. So sometimes we actually got a part of uh, you know asking for the ask of the of the raffle. Yeah. And then, you know, just as long as I am one of the people speaking, I'm going to tell you a very silly, stupid story, which probably has nothing to do with anything. But well, I was, we used to go to these WCA meetings. There were four of us in a room. I mean, now I don't think I am way too old and, you know, <laughs> it's set in my way to share a bed with a friend. Okay. <laughs> but here we were sharing beds, two of us, Eleanor Dickinson, one of them. Okay. Four of us, like, college dorm room in a Hilton hotel, right? We're all taking turns using the bathroom and whatnot. And and um, I had the a thousand, oh, I don't remember, $600 in small bills, right? And this big thing, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with it? <laughs> Took me a while to get my turn to go to the bathroom. Eleanor had to, you know, recolor the little, you know, bright thing in her hair and whatnot. And by the time I got into the bathroom, you know, I, I I took my the sleeping pill because I couldn't sleep with four people in the same room without taking a little sleeping pill. So somehow in the time between I took the sleeping pill and I went to bed, I stashed the money and I couldn't remember in the morning where it was, <laughs> but I knew it was in the room. And it was it was so embarrassing to have to admit to everybody that the money was temporarily lost. So Where was it? Where did you put it? it in a mattress, right? It was in this little secret compartment of my suitcase. But honestly, did I remember putting it there? <laughs> <sighs> anyway. I love that. I, I feel like I'm I'm on this, all of you guys are taking us like on this adventure. Um, it's just very fun. I love your stories. Um, what do you think 
are the most exciting moments uh, working on WCA's Lifetime Achievement Award event. You kind of touched on it a little bit, but what were, do you have any, uh, I'm sorry, do you have any more exciting moments around um, the WCA's Lifetime Achievement Awards that you wanted to touch on? I can, um, my most exciting moment because of I admired her so, so very much was actually meeting Isabel Bishop in person. Oh, and being wow. able to tell her how much her work meant to me. I mean, I, you know, was that I, in 90, 91? all my life that I actually was able to tell her. And she was very um, unassuming person. She, you know, she didn't want the praise. She, she, she was amazing, both as an artist and a person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have had quite a few different um, experiences at the Lifetime Achievement Awards. I remember once when one of our members made an offhand comment that was taken as a horrible insult and I felt like I was a therapist for the rest of the night trying to keep the peace, but it was all good. You know, in the end, I, I think it's funny, but sometimes you remember the little mishaps more than you remember how mostly everything goes great, you know, and it's beautiful. I remember there was a time when Sue Ko, who was a great artist who is very much in the um, anti-meat um, anti-cruelty to animals, we realized that we couldn't mix the two buffets of, you know, meat skewers and stuff. So we did a whole second buffet downstairs that was vegetarian and vegan. And you know, it was delicious. Actually, it was better than the, than the dry chicken skewers upstairs. <laughs> One thing that I admire WCA for is every year I've been involved with the Lifetime and Achievement Award, sometimes with the fundraising and things. I mean, here we have basically just one part-time person in the office. You know, we have the board scattered all over the country. People like Janice, Janice Nesser Chu has, has done so much to keep these things going. But every year, it's just like, I always thought it's like skin of our teeth. And then, then the award ceremony gets pulled off. It's beautiful. It's meaningful. The catalog gets printed. But there are people that really just about kill themselves to make this happen. And that's something I just want to acknowledge that. It's just, it's always amazed me. Well, as I said, I always had played a fairly humble part in this large uh, organization. And for the time that I would remember the Lifetime Achievement Awards, I was usually taking a cab to um, Trader Joe's to get um, eight bunches of flowers and bringing them in early and <laughs> doing our <laughs> own arrangements. <laughs> Saved money. Well, you think that the WCA really has hardly raised its membership fee for years, and the the you know the modest fee is you know a really good thing for artists. But it's it, again, I just think it's remarkable. There have been people that have dedicated a lot to keeping WCA going. So, Karen Lunar is one of them who st stuck out is in the office, and she does the work of three or four people, I think, for us for on part time. She's been a wonderful. Um, continuing presence, uh, a, a, a continue, con continuity between all these different um, presidential uh, presidents times. Well, thank you, Eureka, for sharing all these really wonderful moments that are true fun factors. Um, and you definitely described that well for us all. And I am actually in awe and envious that you got to sleep in the same room and in the same bed with Eleanor Dickinson. <laughs> 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 and on that note of moment funny, but i just got this yeah. blonde streak as a as a as a tribute to her <laughs> that's right. lovely a visual uh memento she would um, trust she would offer to lend me her purple spray to do my hair but i never did i never had the nerve to do it the way she did <laughs> <laughs> there's always a few, there's always another chance. There's always the future. <laughs> On that note, speaking about moments, um, I'd like to segue to some individual questions for Ruth. Um, the Isabel Bishop moment, I'm sure, was wonderful too. We also want you to expound on your moment. Oh, sorry for the timer. Um, 
that um, you were present at the founding of WCA at CAA's 1972 conference in San Francisco. Can you describe this um, founding moment for us? Well, uh, I did speak about it um, a little as I started um, in my introductory remarks. It was a, a, a relatively small, it wasn't a bedroom hotel room, it was a some sort of subsidiary room and it was, it was not large, it was small. And there was a maybe, oh, 30 people in the room. And, um, you know, I think I was the, probably the youngest person in the room at the time. Um, and there were men and women, but the men were African-American, they were not white. And um, people were um, very, um, moved and energized and passionate about the idea that we would start this organization. Um, and it, it, it did feel like a historic moment even at the time, which is pretty amazing. I think we, the people in the room understood that it was really going to be an important moment. The beginning of the Women's Caucus, yeah. Yes, that must have been groundbreaking. Um, and decades later, about the women's um, 40th anniversary, you stated, quote, it amazes me both that I was in the room at the momentous Women's Caucus for Art founding meeting in 1972, and that it is now 40 years ago. How is that possible? What amazes me even more is that while it's much- 50 years ago. <laughs> oh, 50, sorry. <laughs> I, mean, now. Now. I thought it was a 40th one. It sorry. Was. It was, I was just, it's 10 years later that yeah. we're talking right now. So the other things that you mentioned was what, quote, what amazes me even more is that while much has changed, there is still this crucial shared belief in the possibilities for women in the arts. Can you elaborate on this important shared belief in the possibilities for women? Well, I think um, you all know it from the heart. We're here in this room talking from our individual experiences, our individual knowledge, we all experienced, uh, I'm sure, some forms of prejudice and um, belief that um, we couldn't succeed. I mean, I have early memories of Professor Larkin telling um, uh, another woman graduate student and I that we couldn't get MFAs. You know, we could only get MAs because why bother to give women MFAs because we would just waste it would be such a waste, you know, we would just get married and have kids and never be artists. And uh, they weren't gonna waste their money on us, their resources on us. I mean, I think some of the, that kind of belief system persisted and probably still persists, but people are ashamed to say those things out loud now, <laughs> whereas they weren't ashamed to say them at all. And, um, women students, which who were always in the majority because women majoring in art was, you know, considered an okay thing to do, whereas for men and boys it wasn't, which is, you know, I mean, there's reverse prejudice there as well. But, you know, each, each woman had to fight in a way their own battle to, you know, go on, get into graduate school, do an MFA, maybe rather than an MA, and then the years when you were beginning to exhibit your work, all the kinds of uh, discrimination that would, was involved. Um, I mean, things are much, much better. I know I have female graduate students. Um, not that all attitudes have disappeared, but things are incredibly better than they were. And I think we should take a lot of credit for that. The, the WCA really has um, over the years, uh, been an extraordinary position of leadership in, in demonstrating the value of women in the arts and women artists and art historians and um, curators. And uh, we, have, we have much to be proud of and much to continue, much work to continue. I think that's really a really good point, Ruth, that 
we, you've made such a great impact with what you've done with the WCA for women artists in this country. And that's commendable and something to definitely take note of to see that as one of our achievements. Another achievement that um, you were involved with was a direction in the late 1970s and early 80s. And that was the practice of organizing national and regional shows by women artists, which became a new benchmark. How did you achieve this, Ruth, this new benchmark? Um, well, first of all, just the understanding how important exhibitions were and the kind of discriminatory practices and fighting it tooth and nail everywhere we could. We didn't always win. We didn't always get the shows that we wanted. Um, I mentioned uh, that march on the County Museum because there was a major show of contemporary artists, which was already exceptional in 1976. And out of the of, I think 50 artists, 50, 60 artists, two were women, two. Um, so, you know, th there, there was a lot, there was a lot to do. And, and there still are things to do, but there, there was a heroic period, um, that's for sure. And did they start out locally first in order to reach the national level um, just a, a little bit later? Yes, I think that's a good description, yeah. right. And, you know, in a sense, everything is, that becomes national starts out local, uh, starts out somewhere, some specific place and uh, group. Um, the, the original meeting um, for women artists was at CalArts actually, and uh, in 1972. Um, right after the conference in San Francisco. Uh, so it was in Los Angeles and there were people at least from all over the state. Um, there were some men in the room. I, I sat with uh, Judy Chicago and Stanley Grinstein. So Grin Stanley was the founder of Gemini Gel, the big print workshop. Um, and uh, so we had, we had, uh, we had friends among the men. There were men who cared, and that was very important. We needed allies. Absolutely. But, yeah, but it was a, you know, it was a different world. Um, I am so, I mean, not that there isn't prejudice of all kinds. There is terribly enough, but it is so much better than it was. You know, my female graduate students are looking at a a much brighter future than we were. So we've, and, and that's work we've accomplished that we've been made a tremendous difference on. Thank you for reminding us all about that, Ruth. And you're still quite active on a national level and as a member of WCA's Southern California chapter, how has the chapter evolved over time, would you say? Well, it's gotten much bigger and it's more um, diffuse, you know, it's in, more parts, Southern, how are you gonna define Southern California? Where does it stop and start? <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's much more active in the Southern part of the, and, and the Northern. I mean, it's just a larger, a larger geographic area that's uh, served and taken in. So the chapter is definitely larger than it was, which is very good. Thank you, Ruth. And now I'll pass over to Kiara, who's going to um, ask Barbara Willan in individual questions. Hey, thank you. Barbara, what led you to join the Women's Caucus for Art back in 1978? Well, um, I think that maybe what really got me was going to college art and seeing the first big show of women artists in history. Um, uh, from 1550 to 1950, that the leaders of the Women's Caucus and Sutherland Harris and Linda Nochlin prepared. And this was a huge show that traveled around the country showing all these women that we'd never heard of from the Renaissance on to, up, to, up to the, you know, the 20th century. And, um, and I got a job teaching at a, a women's college, Trinity College, as I've mentioned, and um, joined you know, I think I joined the caucus then. I started bringing women into all my courses up and with the graduate, my had, I had um, art history majors and things like that there. And, um, and then um, 
also there was a meeting of the uh, women's the big meet the big year the 1979 when the lifetime achievement awards were given there was this huge campaign to get as many shows of women artists all around the city and they ended up having over 40 a poster with 44 shows on there and I was in this little college and I was asked, would you please do a show? Because I just joined Women's Caucus. Would you do a show of a woman artist? And I managed to pull that off. We didn't even have display panels. I had to get those bought. And I did a um, show of a woman photographer. But I think I did not get to the conference. Darn it, I missed the first Lifetime Achievement Award there. But um, that's when I first got involved. And there was a chapter, a local chapter, that was meeting then at the Washington Women's Art Center. And I did try to, I did go to a couple of meetings. And, but then it, it kind of faded over time and didn't pick up again until 1990 when the national conference was going to be in D.C. again. And um, they, there was a call for people to come help. And that was another thing I remember. This huge room was filled with people that all wanted to help and got on committees. And I got on the exhibition committee and I ended up during the national exhibition that year for DC. And I got a curator that I knew at the Herschel Museum to do it with me. Those days, it wasn't digital, it was all slides. We had 500 slides to go through. It took us weekends to, to, to look at them all and um, to pick the, the winners. Um, so that's when I got involved and when I, then the chapter has gone on from then. So I got into the chapter, wasn't very active, got more active. And then all of a sudden one time it's like, the chapter is going to fold if we don't have a president. So I got my arm twisted to be president and did that for two terms, even though I had a really stressful job that I was doing at the Capitol. I managed to, to do that, too. So. Wow. You mentioned that um, when you first joined WCA that their women weren't even in the textbooks. Can you tell us how um, what you did to shift that? Well, just in my teaching, I made the students read. There were books like I just put them on my shelf, just some books just being written, like this one. This Eleanor Monroe wrote one on women artists. Let me see if you can see it. But anyway, 1979, I made them read out of that. I ordered them for the college library, and um, you know, more books were being published. And uh, 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 Mary Garrett, who is also in Washington one time, she says, you know, they don't, they need art historians on the national board, you should get on the national board. Finally, I ended up um, doing that, but um, what, I, um, as I said, I, I, the WCA really is, it's really happens on the chapter level, and, you know, with the national kind of holding it together, giving the structure during the, the conference, but a lot happens with the chapter. So for a while I was Southeast, uh, regional um, chair and somebody again twisted my arm talked me into doing it that would be fun and so that that was fun and then one year I was at the and I would go to the net I got to go to the, the meetings because I could get paid to go to college art by my job so I was able to go and I ended up being the chapter representative and going to chapter council that's when I first met Laura when she was representing her chapter and uh, one year uh, under Dean Dresser that we were, we met for chapters council and everybody looked around. Dean says, I have the president that leads at this, you need a chair. And I just started leading the meeting because I'd been to a lot of them and ended up, I got into the position that way. And then Laura took it over later, but um, that's really fun because you get to know what's going on in chapters all around the country. And I think that in, I know in the DC chapter, that every time somebody goes to the national conference, they get such a different view of what WCA is about, get so excited about it. They're always really happy that they spent the money and the time to go to the, the national conference. Here, here. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, would you uh, like to um, share on that? Yeah, um, just a, a couple additional notes. Um, you know, a lot of heroic publishing and and meetings and, and shows, the show in 1979 was really important, um, very important. Um, but by the early 90s, things had significantly changed and I became the president of the CAA. Right. I'm the third woman, the first two were art historians, not particularly feminist, but some. And um, then, then after me, um, was a male 
president. Um, and then Judith Brodsky was the second woman artist president. So um, the CAA also was really changing significantly. And that made a big difference because then the WCA and the CAA could, could work on things together. The um, various things that the WCA wanted to do were, you know, were welcomed rather than resisted. So very important that the CAA itself changed significantly. Right. And CAA had a, uh, has, still has a committee on women. Sometimes we, one year we did the, the awards yep. together with them. I got on that just because uh, Eleanor, I think, had done a lot with, you know, trying to keep it working together, but it's not always easy. Yeah. How do you feel being a WC leader shaped your scholarly or curatorial practice? Well, my interest in women artists, I ended up, I've written on a lot of women artists that I've gotten to know. I actually did my PhD dissertation on a male artist, but he had a lot of women students. And so I, I got to know those. I've done exhibitions on them. I just did an exhibition last year that of an organization that th those women were part of. So it has um, made a difference in my life. And at the Capitol, I was always interested in researching the works of art by women or of women in the Capitol and seeing actually in the late 19th and early 19th century, more women got commissions to do art, do the statues than they did in the, later in the 20th century. So, you know, it's things, things have changed. Um, Ruth was saying about how, um, you know, her advisor didn't think she should get an MFA. Well, I had the same kind of thing. I had graduated. Uh, I went to Ober Oberlin College. I was a studio art major and took half art history. And I applied for art history PhD at Harvard and was told kind of the same thing. We're not admitting you. We, you know, you're just gonna, you, you're getting married. So you're just going to have children. You'll never finish. So that's when I went and back and got my master's at Oberlin and then got my degree at the University of Wisconsin. And later on, one of these things that I, I was glad happened was I, my, then my husband was leaving me. I had to get a job. I applied for every job I could at College Art, and one of them was with Harvard. And the same man that had told me that was sitting in the interview room saying, oh, I remember you. And I'm like, they're going to interview me as a for teaching position when they wouldn't let me in? <laughs> I love it. Are you still helping women organize exhibitions or events? Well, what I've been doing in the chapter more is programs and um, for many years and a new woman has just taken over this year. I'm supporting her, but doing programs and getting more younger women involved with it. So I'm really glad for that. But I, I like doing programs because I would do things I would enjoy, like trying to get people to see exhibitions of important exhibitions and we I started something way back in the 90s called an art chat, which meant we would meet in an exhibition and see it together, talk about it, and then maybe have lunch or something and talk about it some more. And still, still been doing those just until recently. So um, the chat, there's a lot of wonderful people, um, including Sandra Davis, who's done wonderful exhibitions with our chapter, really bringing the, um, the make challenging topics for them on racism and diversity and immigration, things like that, which it, it is, have really been great. Um, but so I entered a couple exhibitions, not too many. I, I do make a little art, but I've done the programs is what I've done mostly. Thank you, Barbara. And can I just say something and add just a little something there is that I think that uh, with the exhibitions uh, that the WCA manages to put together by hook and crook, uh, both on the local level and on the national level, that it opens it up to all the members, the members bring in their work, they learn how to ship their work, how to send it, how to, and then they get it on their resume as well, and seen by a whole different group of people on the other side of the country. So I think all of that is, 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 good to keep all that going as well. So I wanted to add one more thing, which is that a long time WCA thing that our chapter, I think all the chapters do is art chairs where people meet and share their work and get feedback. That's been such a big, um, I think just a 
big part of that networking and support for artists. And we were able to do it, I think, pretty successfully during the pandemic, you know, on Zoom, sharing images. But that's, I think it's, that's, people get very encouraged by getting positive responses to their work and having people see and understand what they're doing. I think it's helped a lot of people move, really move ahead. And I know in our chapter in their art. Thank you. This is just a little memory history thing that I'm gonna share is that Eleanor Dickinson was my mentor, yeah. and, you know, because she was a guerrilla girl. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that, but now that she's gone, I feel like it's, it's all, we can recognize <laughs> the fact that she was a fierce guerrilla and that um, we would go to get her the museum shows and we would, you take this side, I'll take that side. And you write down Barbara, woman, one, <laughs> right? Tad, man, two, you know, you'd go through it. Is Visha a man or a woman? You know, and so we would go through and actually get our own statistics for the shows in San Francisco. You know, any show, she really never turned it off. Was so Eleanor did very important work gathering statistics for years and years and years. And I don't, there's nobody's picked up really after her, but I, until like 10 years ago, I would go to a new museum and I would look and see, and really one out of 20 things hanging in the, in the, in the a room were, or an area were by a woman. Now it's changed all of a sudden, just the last few years, but for all these decades, it really hasn't. But that Gathering the statistics is important because that gave, you know, facts, you know, to base the, um, you know, the different um, ideas that we need more women in the, in the museums and collections. Eleanor. It's almost like they were the first feminists doing data <clears throat> visualization um, <laughs> and wearing masks and concealing their identity. It's really something. And, and her whole feeling was that you never really had to scream and yell about more women, not enough women. How come the men? All you had to do was show the little statistic that said out of 200, um, you know, participants, one is a woman. You know, that's it was just the the pure statistic part of it is was the uh, was the um, argument. Men couldn't deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, could we ask one more question to Barbara, um, a little bit more about your major achievements as vice president for chapter relations um, from 1998 to 2010? Is there anything you'd like to share with us with that, Barbara? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, I think it's an ongoing thing. As Laura knows, you're trying to keep in communication with chapters, try to encourage inter-chapter um, communications and things like that. And um, uh, you know, running that meeting and at the at the conference and trying to encourage people who are starting new chapters and support them. I mean, there was also things like, um, you know, we uh, worked a lot on the chapter handbook. I don't even know if it still exists for uh, guidelines for people starting new chapters. Um, you know, how you set up your bylaws. What do you have to do? I mean, that's still, an, I think, an important thing for. Um, there are new chapters forming now and there must be online now, but um, we used to have notebooks and things like that that would pass out. Well, thank you to all our panelists, Eureka, Barbara and Ruth for such a really informative and inspiring interaction here. It wasn't just um, individual interviews. We all were able to have a really um, cooperative and collaborative conversation. Thank you all of you. And also to our Zoom host, um, Laura Morrison, WCA past president. Laura, did you want to take it over in terms of um, introducing and opening it up to the audience for some Q&A? Yes, I would. Um, people can put their chat in or raise their hand. Um, there was one question from Sandra Davis regarding the Black men that were in the, um, the room when WCA was uh, first founded, she said, do you know if there are any of African-American men, are, if the African-American men are still living or, con or uh, in con are you in contact with their families or do you know who they were, no? But it is noteworthy that on the two, on two very public, well, not public occasions, but on two formative occasions, 
in, on the West Coast at least, that the men who did show support and interest were all African-Americans yeah. in the room initially, and then at the march at the County Museum. So. I mean, I've always believed that if men want to join WCA, they can, if they want to support women artists, right? Our chapter had the husbands or people helping, we always call them the men's auxiliary, you know, helping get the ladders and put things up. But um, that show that I juried in 91, there was one man who um, applied for it, who was a member, and we ended up putting him in, you know, so. Um, we had a show up here in New Hampshire um, um, called Force of Nature, and we allowed men to enter because we wanted feminists, men to support, the support the cause and we had I think four or five and um you know we're what I like about WCA is we're very inclusive anyone can join men women doesn't matter and and be part of uh the organization um let's see Renee Sandal said to everyone is there a clearinghouse for uh publications I have a batch sitting in my pal Renee what exactly what batch of what well I have a batch of <laughs> Uh, early publications from Chrysalis, Heresies, Women's Art Journal, and I had an article published in the first issue on Marie Lauren Sand. So, um, but I, I really need to move them. So I know I, there should be someone who's dying to get their hands on the materials, um, but I haven't found them yet. So, so you, have you tried the Women's Museum in Washington? Yeah. I, library. yeah. If they don't have it, yeah. yeah. I think they haven't, they're not accepting, but I will double check. I just thought maybe. To well, keep... you also might check with Judith Brodsky. Okay. But Rutgers, yeah, they have a big Rutgers. archives. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And specifically on feminism. So, yeah, feminist art. I did my dissertation in 1978 on that topic, and I actually used uh, my primary data was from the early syllabi for all the women women, uh, the fem all the feminist art courses, that's what I've analyzed. So yeah, Wonderful. long time ago, mm -hmm. same issues too. <laughs> all right, you. going through the chat, does anyone have some other questions? So I just wanted to, um, Barbara, you asked if the membership handbook still exists. Yes, it does. Okay. I updated it. Um, Oh, I think three or four years ago. Um, but now that we have a new membership portal, we're going to have to update it again. So that's one of my my projects um, coming up in the next couple, probably the next <laughs> few months. Um, uh, Margaret Parker, is there a WCA archive at Rutgers? Yes, there is. Rutgers has been closed during the pandemic. So um, they're just starting, the library there is just starting to open up. We have lost our office at Rutgers and we are going to have to clear oh, it out um, oh. in June, I think. It's coming up. And so we are temporarily going to be getting a storage locker near Karen Lunar so she can move what she has in her garage into, into the uh, storage locker and everything from um, Rutgers. But this I mean, I have been thinking about this for a while. Um, I really feel that we need to have, I don't know, you would call it an art historian committee, an art history committee for WCA to start really mm -hmm. um, sifting through what we have and trying to actively get, you know, these into our archives. Judy Brodsky's also um, talked about, um, going through our archives and kind of organizing them and, and seeing what's there would be a great dissertation project for someone that has never happened. I mean, there's a, um, there's a lot in there and it would be nice to have more organized. So, um, and I don't know, to, to be honest, uh, if Rutgers will accept everything we want to put in there or not. Um, so now that they're opening up again, we, I think it's something, especially with this Art Writers Committee and the history project we've been working on, it's really something to start thinking about and looking for and maybe building a brand new committee for that. So um, 
So but way back, the um, WCA had an office at the Moore College in Philadelphia. And then, you know, with a, with a, a you know, again, a stable person and yeah. uh, office and everything. And then when the board at one point made a decision to move to New York, that disappeared. It's really upsetting that the office isn't there, but, you know, to find some place. Um, yeah, uh, things are changing a lot. Rutgers, um, from what I understand, um, do you know if there's archives at Moore College, do you believe? Well, I, I would have assumed they would have moved, right? I would assume so. Um, so I, I, I don't know that for sure. As I know, but again, something to check, but wow. Okay, um, I have a question. Um, so you talked a little bit, Eureka, about Eleanor being your mentor. And I'm wondering, um, Barbara and Ruth, if you had mentors that you found um, in WCA or if you've mentored others. Um, well, the person who is the greatest influence on me and uh, the most profound discussions and, you know, I mean, this was such a blessing was my friendship with June Wayne. Wayne. June Wayne, me too, June Wayne. She was superwoman activist. Mm -hmm. She was incredible, indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I couldn't say enough wonderful things about June. So. And for Southern California, ac absolutely transformational, but an influence all over the country as well. Mm -hmm you know, the founder of Tamarind Press and all of that, but, but a lot more um, activity in terms of feminism. Was she in the Northern California chapter or? No, she was in Southern California. Southern California, okay. So my mentor in art history was Ellen Johnson, who um, was an art historian, I think, and I knew, also knew, um, uh, I'm forgetting her name, um, another one of our Lifetime Achievement Awardees at, at Oberlin, but it wasn't so much just with feminism, it was more with people like Eleanor Dickinson, people like that, that I met through WCA, I think, and um, Mary Garrard, people like that, Norma Browdy, you know, people that inspired me. Mm -hmm. And many, many others. <laughs> I wanted to say because I saw Margaret Parker is on. And I wanted to email her and I didn't. I saw Margaret and Brenda Obama, our, our previous WCA president, on the Woman House program. It was part of the CAA conference that they were their, their Chicago show that picked up a you know revised that. I just really loved that panel. Great. Mm -hmm. um, anyone help, ha, else have any other questions? Want to put. We've talked a lot about um, the history. Um, one of the things as I've been um, president and reading through things, I wanted to, um, I was kind of amazed because I didn't know tons about WCA history, but reading uh, more deeply, I'm astonished by how much change WCA affected at CAA in the first few years it was in being, I mean, it, those early years, the women in WCA did so much work and affected so much change and were the basis of the feminist art movement. I mean, I had no true idea how important WCA was um, it, affecting all of this kind of change mm -hmm. and, and, and their place really in history in the feminist art movement. And um, it's been extremely impressive for me. I think wanna thank everyone who has um, worked towards this and continues to, and um, it's been it, it's been very rewarding for me as president to learn this, and I really like the work that the Art Writers Committee is doing, and um, I think programs like this are going to be very informative to a lot of our members. Um, so, I wanted to know if Barbara, Ruth, and Eureka, you had questions. For, for the others. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, was, was, was Cynthia Navarretta in that room where you were 
opening up the first meeting of the WCA? I thought she mentioned that she was, but it's it's very possible that she was. Um, uh, Thalia Guma Peterson was in that room. Yeah, Thalia is the person I was trying to think of. I knew her at Oberlin. Yeah, yeah. 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 How about Mary Gerard and Norma Browdy? Were they there at that first meeting? I don't believe so. Uh, Maybe you know, not. No. Terribly important, but not at that first. Not one. that very first one. But she became an early on president and got it. The uh, organization incorporated, got it, made the affiliate association, kept that association with CAA. And wasn't it Mary Garrard who really had the uh, the concept of the chapters and got the first chapters rolling? I think so I think yeah, there was the DC. There was ones in California, New York. Yeah, and then gradually more and more so that it wasn't just a, and that, that's that been so crucial for the organization. Great. I just also wanted to share that um, the WCA interview project that is now up, the interviews, the videos that were done live that are on the Art Insights blog, really also um, sort of mirror what the, the things that you're talking about here, including Mary Garrard's recent interview done by uh, Margot Hobbs. And some of these points that we're talking about are listed in these interviews. It's a wonderful archive that um, Kiara and Marianne McGrath are developing. So furthering some of these conversations, we have a beginning record there as well, um, as in addition to the Artlines uh, magazine. So, and some of you have already done the interviews and we're hoping to do an interview with Yuriko Takata soon as well. Great. Really important work. That's great. Thank you, Patty, for doing doing this and getting both of you, yeah, for doing this. Patty, thank you, Kiara. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Laura. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't meet in person. We would have been doing this at the WCA conference last month. Um, so that's a shame, but I'm so happy that we were able to um, record this for Zoom and for our membership and we'll be sharing it with everyone. So actually probably more people will be able to uh, see it and experience it than who would have all been able to come to the conference. Um, so I think that that's a lot of fun. I'd like to say that the next second Saturday is on April 9th from 1 to 2.30 um, p.m. Eastern time. And I'll just read the description for it. Um, it's the role of art and activism in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM education. Amanda Banks chairs a multimedia session on the role of art and activism in uh, STEM, STEM education. Panelists will present projects that, are brought, that brought art into traditionally STEM disciplines such as life science, medicine, and engineering. The advantages of a more holistic education will be considered an innovative pro project such as art made via bacterial culture will be presented. And the panel chair is Amanda Banks, who is the president of the Alabama chapter. And the, palace, uh, the panelists are Jessica Nuno, Sarah Adkins, Jablonski, and Phoebe Burns. So we will have um, that up on our website soon and in the April Pulse and we'll start doing social media posts for it and people can register um, to get the link for that through uh, our membership portal. So I wanna thank you everyone. Um, a round of applause. Yeah, and I uh, appreciate you taking the time today. And thank you, Patty and uh, Kiara for, for organizing this for us. Thank you from all the Art Career uh, Writers Committee members too. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It has been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thank you. Discussion. Really. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Great to see everyone again. And uh, uh, nice to meet you, Chiara and Patty. I haven't seen you in person. So, <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.